nations. There's no video that justifies an attack on an embassy. October 8th, at a San Francisco fundraiser, President Obama pushes the idea the threat from al-Qaeda is waning. And today, al-Qaeda's on its heels, and Osama bin Laden is no more. Then, the next day, October 9th, the State Department provides off-camera a blow-by-blow -blow account of the Benghazi attack. Reporters learned the compound was overwhelmed by an organized assault. Fighters armed with machine guns, mortars, and possibly rocket-propelled grenades. October 10th, Congress holds a contentious hearing on the attack in Libya, and Americans learn that State Department officials, despite being warned of escalating attacks, refused to beef up security in Libya. The shocking revelations made the first question in the next night's vice presidential debate all but inevitable. I would like to begin with Libya. And turned questions about what really happened in Benghazi into one of the most heated issues of the presidential campaign. Beyond the controversy over who said what are bigger issues. Next, Special Report investigates what Benghazi reveals about President Obama's foreign policy. Is it smart diplomacy or geopolitical correctness? Fox's chief intelligence correspondent, Catherine Herridge, asks, if you're reluctant to call terrorism by its name, can you ever defeat the terrorists? You know, we have no uh, information to suggest that it was a pre-planned uh, attack. We've seen rage and violence directed at American embassies over an awful internet video. It was a spontaneous uh, reaction to what had just transpired in Cairo. Does the Obama administration have a problem calling the threat by its name? There's no question that they have um, avoided the use of the word terror. We've seen Former Congressman way. Porter Goss was head of the CIA under President George W. Bush. We can't ignore criminal acts. We can't ignore terrorist acts. <laughs> Goss says the risk of ignoring terrorism is especially high in a part of the world awash in lethal weapons, and Libya was just such a part of that world. Case in point, a mysterious Libyan ship picked up in Turkey on September 6th, just five days before Ambassador Chris Stevens, Information Management Officer Sean Smith, and former Navy SEALs Tyrone Woods and Glenn Doherty were killed during the extended terrorist assault in Benghazi. According to an initial September 14th report by the Times of London, 400 tons of cargo was on board, some of it humanitarian, and it was reportedly also holding a large consignment of weapons headed for serious rebels. The ship and its cargo are a huge warning sign that the situation on the ground in Libya is vastly more dangerous than even the State Department may have realized. Even before the well-organized massive attack in Benghazi that killed an ambassador who knew well the threat from al-Qaeda in the region was large and growing. What do you think al-Qaeda looks like today, especially in North Africa? It's much stronger. It's spreading out. Uh, so there's no question in your mind that al-Qaeda is stronger in North Africa today than it was four years ago. Oh, absolutely. We've got all kinds of new franchise operations. The Benghazi attack and the administration's reaction to it suggests to Goss that this White House doesn't get it. The problem is they're avoiding reality, and bad things happen when you avoid reality, and unfortunately we've just seen that. We, we are in a stronger position today. Uh, than we were four years ago. P.J. Crowley, former United States Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs under President Obama, believes the president's anti-terror policies are paying off, particularly in places like Libya. We've gone through a dramatic transition, you know, called the Arab Spring. These transitions to democracy are a repudiation of everything that bin Laden stood for and, and tried to achieve, you know, through violent means. Crowley says you don't make Americans safer with words that inflame. You do it by winning over those we can work with. We're at the stage where we need partnerships to solve any meaningful uh, crisis around the world. Uh, the United States can never do that alone. Do you believe that there are a lot of dead Americans as a result of this administration's refusal to call the threat what it is? I do. And show signs of weakness. They take uh, that as an opportunity and they will attack. What did the president say, and when did he say it? That question is one of the most explosive in the presidential campaign. Could the election turn on the answer after the break? The Benghazi terror attack, the White House response, the November election. Democrats accuse Republicans of gotcha politics. Republicans say this is an issue that cuts to the heart of the election. 
this much is certainly true. It's an issue that is not going away soon. By October, the Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney is regularly hitting President Obama hard on Libya. The attack on our consulate can't be blamed on a reprehensible video insulting Islam, despite the administration's attempts to convince us of that for so long. But Obama deputy campaign manager Stephanie Cutter insists the only reason it's a political issue at all is because Romney and Ryan are making it one. October 11th, right before the vice presidential debate, I asked her if she really meant that. What are you suggesting here? Are you suggesting that we're playing politics with this? I'm not suggesting because anything. You, you have said to, that you, you have the to entire concede. reason this has become the political topic. Right. Four people are dead. Absolutely. Every and this administration, let me just get my sentence out. This administration has treated this entire tragedy with the utmost seriousness. Now, at the same time that we're doing that, we have two people campaigning around the country accusing us of covering something up. But in the vice presidential debate itself, moderator Martha Raddatz makes Libya her first question. Wasn't this a massive intelligence failure, Vice President Biden? What it was, it was a tragedy, Martha. We will get to the bottom of it because whatever mistakes are made will not be made again. Congressman Ryan. What we are watching on our TV screens is the unraveling of the Obama foreign policy. And they wanted but, more security there. Well, we weren't told they wanted more security again. We did not know they wanted more security again. Biden not only places the blame squarely on the State Department and the intelligence community, he also seems to flatly contradict what State Department officials have said under oath. That sends the administration backpedaling the next day, October 12th. What the vice president said was that uh, we were we, told they wanted more security there, is what he said. That's, that's a quote. Correct, yeah. He is talking so he about. Was never briefed. That's clear. He was never briefed that more security was needed. There was. A, Clearly, the uh, White House is going to need a uh, bus with, uh, you know, huge truckosaurus sized wheels for every element of the government that they're throwing under there. Conservative author and commentator Mark Stein has written about Islamic terrorism for years. They got the intelligence community uh, under there. I mean, they got the State Department under there. Hi, Ambassador. Can you speak with us briefly about the attack in Benghazi? Uh, this is not an appropriate time, but thanks for your interest. But Rice's boss will crawl under that bus herself. On October 15th, Monday, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton says she takes responsibility for what happened in Benghazi. I want to do everything I can to protect our people, and I also want to make sure that we track down whoever did this and bring them to justice. Clinton's mea culpa comes a day before the second presidential debate, where the president, for the first time, takes responsibility too, then goes after Romney. The day after the attack, Governor, I stood in the Rose Garden, and I told the American people that this was an act of terror, and the suggestion that anybody in my team would play politics or mislead when we've lost four of our own governor is offensive. That set off an exchange that may go down as one of the most remarkable in the history of televised presidential debates. You said in the Rose Garden the day after the attack it was an act of terror. It was not a spontaneous demonstration. Is that what you're saying? Please proceed, Governor. I, I, I want to make sure we get that for the record, because it took the president 14 days before he called the attack in Benghazi an act of terror. Get the transcript. It, 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 he did, in, in fact, sir. So let me, let me call it an act of Can terror. Can you say that a little louder, Candy? He, he, he did call it an act of terror. Only after the debate does Crowley admit that maybe she was the one with her facts wrong. Syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer was part of Fox's debate coverage that night. The next day she walked away from it, whereas her intervention on behalf of Obama was in front of 60, 70 million people who will remember that and not know anything about her walking away. Then Thursday, October 18th, a report claims Secretary of State Clinton ordered security in Libya beefed up, a request that was never carried out. And just today, official State Department cables showing Ambassador Stevens was increasingly worried about al-Qaeda security threats in the weeks leading up to the Benghazi attack, and even cables signed by Stevens on September 11th, the day he was killed. More reasons for America to ask, who is ultimately responsible for leaving those Americans so vulnerable? If it's the White House, this will be devastating. But Mark Stein hopes the political post-mortem doesn't obscure the more frightening fact that terrorism may be back with a vengeance, and America is woefully unprepared. 
But you know, what's wicked about this, Brett, is that the real politicization here is uh, the guys who actually only see this in terms of, you know, ooh, will it, uh, will it hurt us in Ohio? Uh, might it cause us problems in Florida? This could go bad for Obama. Uh, nuts to that. It's real bad for the United States because this is a humiliation for the United States. It's bad for Chris Stevens. It's bad for Sean Smith. It's bad for Glenn Doherty. It's bad for Tyrone Woods. They're dead. They're gone. That's another reason I think I'm here. To take, give a voice to those who don't have a voice anymore. Which brings us back to Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood, who saw the deadly debacle at Benghazi coming. I can tell you're a little emotional about it. This is a ambassador who was killed, first one since 1979, and he's your friend. I mean, it's a huge thing to, to have a loss like that. I grieve for uh, his loss. I grieve for the loss that we've, we suffer as a nation. It was our job to defend the compound. Thank you, Matt. I, I wish we could have been there. The Benghazi attack staggered America. We now have another reason to mourn on 9-11 and a new unmistakable warning. The Islamic terrorists who brutalized our citizens in Libya were well-trained, well-armed killers intent on doing us great harm. The brave, beleaguered Americans in Libya knew that long before they died. The rest of us owe it to them to understand that too. That's our program. I'm Brett Baer. Thanks for watching.